welcome very much. This is our conference on passing the one-year mark, how the Ukrainian displacement crisis shapes the European and American policy. Um, the idea of this conference came up several months ago in part because the focus in the American media is all around the, the, the military uh, actions, as well it should be. Um, and we were looking at all of the broader implications of this war. It's a tragic war, and the death toll keeps climbing, and we wanted to bring together experts and regional experts to really talk about and share what's going on, discuss what some options are, and then we also wanted to hear what's happening in Connecticut. Our state has been open and welcoming refugees. Um, we'll hear from some of them today, and we'll hear to one of the leaders from one of the leaders who's been organizing a lot of those efforts. So with that, I'd really like to thank you all for taking time and coming out today. And I'd like to kindly introduce the president of Quinnipiac University, Judy Olian. Welcome, everyone. This is, in a sense, a somber moment to be uh, commemorating a year-long uh, invasion by Russia of the Ukraine. It's something that we have to remember, uh, but not one of those auspicious moments that uh, represent a happy anniversary, other than the admiration that we have for the resilience of the Ukrainians. Um, thank you, Chris, for organizing this, um, and also for Gideon Werner, who is um, a co-director of the European, uh, uh, the European International Institute here at Quinnipiac. I'm, I'm very glad that we are talking about the, the implications of this invasion, the way you, the U.S. and Europe has responded, and in particular the refugee crisis that has emerged from this. Uh, many in the world, including importantly the U.S., have rallied to support the Ukraine against this threat on its sovereign powers. And, and we know that the scale of tragedy in the Ukraine has been really unfathomable. The loss of lives, the separation and displacement of families, uh, the devastation of the economy and the well-being of communities, uh, across the entire country. And we're also seeing how interconnected the geopolitical risks have become. And, and just a few bullet points on that. The escalation in the tensions between Russia and the Ukraine has added to the destabilization of China-US relations, and at the same time to closer Russia-China military and trading ties. On the, on the other side, the, the war has resulted in a more unified and expanded NATO, perhaps one would say a rebirth of NATO, which itself may lead to more extreme reactions uh, from Russia. The macroeconomic effects of the war have infected the entire world. The fossil fuel crisis in Europe has entirely altered energy supply chains and radically increased the cost of oil and gas, including also in the United States, even though we are self-sufficient. It has introduced limits on food productions in the Ukraine that have co caused food prices to skyrocket everywhere in the world, and it's also exacerbated starvation in Africa. And both higher fuel prices, higher food prices have contributed to the increase in global inflation. So the impact of this war are staggering. And sadly, it is not clear if there's any end in sight. Prognosticators have a lot of different views on what the end game might be, how long the war will go on whether either of the sides might compromise, 
or might even capitulate in the face of continuing human, economic and societal costs of the war in both countries? Whether the West will exhaust its willingness to arm the Ukrainian forces and force settlement talks and some quid pro quo in some post-war protections for those settlement talks, and or, and it's an and, uh, if the West can afford to tolerate the risk of a trigger to a much more expanded conflict if something really bad and unexpected happens, like a nuclear provocation at the extreme. So I certainly don't have any answers, but I expect our guests will have some answers, and if not answers, at least opinions. Uh, we're privileged to have with us a distinguished set of scholars, diplomats, global policy experts, and lawmakers, including our own U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal. Uh, again, very grateful to Chris Ball, who heads our Central European Institute for the work organizing this important discussion. And this ties very much to our mission at Quinnipiac University to nurture enlightened global citizens prepared for careers of the future. And we have students here delighted to see that. Programs like today offer our students the opportunity to learn about the complex interdependencies around the world, the macro forces shaping our lives and our economies, and the threats to democracy and human rights that our students, our future generations, need to guard against. I want to just thank our sponsors for today, the Quinnipiac Central European Institute, the Quinnipiac Novak Family Polish Chair, Gideon Werner, Mirtha Kalina Law Firm, Quinnipiac Republicans, Quinnipiac Democrats, these are our two student organizations, Quinnipiac Student Veterans Organization, and the Quinnipiac Office of Veterans and Military Affairs. Thank you for your support and for being here and for your service to the nation. I want to thank everyone for coming. And let me introduce our wonderful senator, Senator Blumenthal, who will also uh, make some opening remarks. Senator Blumenthal, for those of you who are not Connecticut residents, recently convincingly won his third term as the US senator from Connecticut. He served in Washington since 2011 after having served 20 great years as the Connecticut Attorney General. He's a very prominent member of the Democratic leadership of the Senate. He serves on a number of key committees, including Veterans Affairs, where he spearheaded legislation that expands employment opportunities and increases housing access for veterans and importantly, provides health care for veterans exposed to toxic chemicals during their service. And Senators, Senator Blumenthal's longtime advocacy on behalf of consumer protections is also recognized in his leadership of the Commerce Consumer Protection Subcommittee of the Senate. So, Senator, thank you for your service to the state and to the nation, and let's provide a warm welcome to Senator Richard Blumenthal. Uh, thank you so much, President Olian. I am excited and honored to be here today, and I really want to thank you, Judy Olian, and all of Quinnipiac, all of you who are here today uh, on a snowy, Saturday, and uh, especially thank the representatives from other countries who are going to be on the panel. Uh, you know, I've been to Ukraine three times over roughly the past year, and this one year anniversary, I've been here in Connecticut and seen the outpouring of support all across the state, and in fact, hearing from my colleagues about similar shows of 
the port across the nation. America has really come together in support of Ukraine. And my goal as I go back to Washington is to make sure that we continue to be steadfast, strong, unwavering in the United States Congress for military aid and humanitarian assistance that is no less needed now than at the start of this conflict. I first went to Ukraine before the invasion, several weeks before the invasion. I came back and I said to my colleagues and I said to the President personally, you know, our intelligence community, our military gives Ukraine about three days, five days before the Russians take Kyiv. And I said, these people are going to fight to the last person. And if you think President Zelensky is going to leave, you better think again. And in fact, he stayed. He provided a model to the world of courage, resilience, resolve, embodying that spirit for the people of Ukraine and leading them in a way that was truly Churchillian. And America ought to be proud that we have provided military support, the Javelins and the Stingers, after some delay, HIMARS, longer range artillery, again, after some delay, tanks, armored vehicles, Bradleys, Strikers, the Germans have provided Leopard tanks, the English, the Challenger, and the United States, the Abrams. And now we are at the point where we need to provide planes. Planes like the F-16s that can enable Ukraine to mount a counteroffensive, an effective counteroffensive, because the Russians right now are in the midst of their offensive. And so far it's been faltering, but the Ukrainians have to punch through those entrenched lines of Russians in order to mount an effective counteroffensive. That's the military assistance that we owe them. And at the same time, there is a humanitarian crisis, which is the focus of today's seminars. That humanitarian crisis I have seen personally at the Polish border. Because in addition to those three trips to Kyiv, I've also gone to the border and I've seen Ukrainian refugees coming across with not much more than the shirt and clothing on their backs, clutching their pets and pet toys, almost all women and children because the men have stayed to fight. Going to Poland, going to other countries that are represented here today, and they are heroes because they have taken those refugees, millions in Poland alone, meeting with the top-ranking Polish officials, what I have seen in them and in the people of Poland is immense generosity and warmth because they understand, they understand that this brutal Russian aggression is their fight too. It is their fight very up close and personal, and it is our fight in the United States. Because you know, and I know, and America should know that Vladimir Putin will keep going if he is not stopped in Ukraine. He will keep going against NATO countries. And then United States troops will be involved. Zelensky does not need nor does he want United States troops. What he wants are the tools to win the war, and that's the objective, enabling them to win the war, which will also enable a lot of the refugees to return. And many want to return. And many are in this country and want to make a life in this country 
and we should welcome them to this country. I want to say, and maybe it'll make a little news, that I will be offering legislation called the Ukrainian Adjustment Act. The Ukrainian Adjustment Act will provide a path to permanent status for Ukrainian refugees who are here and have a temporary status. As you know, parole or humanitarian parole, as it's called, provides no more than a temporary status. What they need and deserve is assurance that they will be safe and secure in this country. And we will be better for it because they are bringing to us the talents, the energy, the gifts of intelligence, the cultural enrichment, just like other immigrant groups have done in the United States. We are a nation of immigrants. We are proudly a nation of immigrants. And And those Ukrainian refugees who are here in this country deserve what we are also trying to do for the Afghan at-risk allies, those translators and interpreters, the guards and embassy workers who protected our troops and our diplomats in Afghanistan and therefore now have targets on their backs from the Taliban, the Afghan Adjustment Act provides an example of what we can now do for Ukrainians who equally need that security and assurance that they can stay in this country. I'm hopeful not only that the United States will stay united and that we will provide that safety and assurance for Ukrainian refugees who have come here, but also that NATO will stay united. The unity that I saw just last weekend at this very moment, one week ago, I was in Munich at the Munich Security Conference speaking with the foreign ministers of Germany, France, other NATO nations, and that resolve remains unshakable. We need to make sure that it remains so. And that those NATO allies also provide safety and security for refugees who are fleeing the conflict in Ukraine. So I'm really proud to be here today, although we all wish that there weren't a first anniversary, that this conflict had never happened, it is a war of choice, Vladimir Putin's choice to start it. It will be his choice to end it. When I visited Ukraine on one of my trips to Kyiv, we went to the town of Bucha, just outside Kyiv. In fact, it's about 15 minutes by car. That's how close the Russians came to taking Kyiv. And in Bucha, we saw the mass grave where Putin's soldiers tied women and children's hands behind their backs and shot them, hundreds of them, in the head and then buried them in those mass graves. Those war crimes are indeed crimes against humanity. They are crimes against humanity that should be pursued in an international tribunal. Many of those refugees who have come to this country lost loved ones to those crimes against humanity. Many Ukrainian Americans, some may be in this audience, have lost loved ones to those crimes against humanity. I am working with 
the prosecutor of Ukraine, the chief prosecutor. We've met with him five times over just the last couple of months to provide the resources that he needs to pursue those war crimes and crimes against humanity. And we should be supportive, we should be involved, because the rule of law should count for something here. And we may never see Vladimir Putin brought before that international tribunal physically, but he should be put on trial too. He should be held accountable and he should be convicted with evidence that we can help Ukrainians collect and use. There is a lot that we can do besides providing the military assistance that is so vital. But I really want to thank every one of you for your interest, your concern, your involvement, and conclude by saying that one of my visits was with President Zelensky in a dark time. He had just lost his interior ministry. And he said something that I will always remember. We asked him whether he thought he would win. And he said, in the end, it will be fine. And if it's not fine, it will not be the end. The people of Ukraine will keep fighting. They will fight with pitchforks if they need to. Americans recognize in them something in ourselves. We recognize that fighting spirit that has animated us since the revolution, our own revolution. It's the same spirit that brought American men and women to volunteer in World War II. It's the spirit of defending democracy and freedom. And the Ukrainians are fighting for our democracy and freedom as much as their own. And we should welcome the refugees in this country from that conflict and resolve that we will stand with Ukraine. Thank you all for being here. Slavo Ukraini. Thank you very much, President Olian, and for your comments and thoughts and just for being here and what you're doing fighting for these causes in the Senate, um, Senator Blumenthal. Uh, one more round of applause. <clears throat> Today's conference isn't about the military side of things as much, although that is pervasive through the entire conversation, obviously. My personal views are exactly as yours, so thank you for what you're doing. Let me bring in a recorded message from abroad. Вітаю всіх учасників конференції. Мене звати Олександр Васюк, я народний депутат України. У першу чергу, я хочу подякувати організаторам та учасникам конференції за увагу до цієї важливої теми – міграція українців через повномасштабне вторгнення. Я дякую кожному з вас, хто підтримував і продовжує підтримувати Україну у гуманітарних, безпекових, економічних питаннях та на міжнародному рівні. Дякую за вашу підтримку на шляху до нашої перемоги. Уже минув рік від початку повномасштабного вторгнення. Рівно рік, як Україна прокинулась від вибухів, і кожен українець, на жаль, на собі відчув, що таке війна. Як це поспіхом збирати речі та тікати світ за очі з рідних міст та сел. Як залишатися в країні, але ховати дітей у холодних підвалах і молитися Богу, щоб вижити після чергового ракетного обстрілу. Як взяти до рук зброю та йти на справжню війну, ризикуючи власним життям воювати за територіальну цілісність та незалежність своєї країни? Я вдячний нашим військовим, які мужньо боронять Україну. Ми всі розуміємо, що повномасштабне вторгнення спричинило найбільшу міграційну кризу в Європі з часів Другої світової війни. Раптове переміщення великої кількості населення 
створило нові виклики та загострило вже існуючі. Це стосується як громад, які приймають біженців, так і тих громад, звідки відбувся відтік людей. І, на жаль, через повномасштабне вторгнення та міграції Україна втрачає фахівців у різних сферах. Найголовніше для держави – це її люди, які руками тут будували своє майбутнє та майбутнє України. І питання, як їх повернути, залишається відкритим. Сьогодні ми поговоримо про те, як українська криза переміщення впливає на Європу, на США та на Україну. Яка ситуація з біженцями та тимчасово переміщеними особами, та які виклики стоять перед суспільством цих країн. Щоб зрозуміти масштаби кризи, давайте подивимось на офіційні цифри. За останніми даними Агентства ООН у справах біженців, 8 мільйонів біженців з України наразі знаходяться у Європі. Трохи більше – половини зареєстровані як біженці. Знайшли прихисток українців США завдяки програмі «Єднання заради України» яку запровадив президент США Джо Байден. Окрім біженців, які виїхали до інших країн, всередині України, за даними Міністерства соціальної політики, налічується майже 5 мільйонів внутрішньо переміщених осіб. Це тих, які зареєстровані як ВПО. І всі ми розуміємо, чим довше триватиме повномасштабне вторгнення, тим більше зростатимуть потреби. І тим більше підтримки з боку міжнародної гуманітарної спільноти потребуватиме Україна. Я безмежно вдячний всім громадянам країн, які надавали і надають тимчасове житло українцям, щойно почалася війна і продовжують це робити зараз. Дякую за міжнародну підтримку. Усім учасникам конференції я бажаю плідної роботи в обговоренні та успішних кейсів, які допоможуть вирішити ті проблеми і ті проблемні питання, які сьогодні з'явилися перед Україною та світом через повне масштабне російське вторгнення. He was not able to be with us today, but um, wished to send this video specifically for our conference. Um, so while he can't hear us, I think we owe him a round of applause. So one change, uh, Monica Palutai from the Hudson Institute will also be moderating this panel. Um, Horvat Zhuzhan, the, the Hungarian ambassador to the Ukraine, was unable to come, and stepping in for her today will be Viktor Marshai, who is the director of the Migration Research Institute, and he will join in the roundtable um, following this. I did want to thank again President Olian and Senator Blumenthal. I want to thank all of you who came here. And I wanted to take a second at the, begin because, at the beginning, because I know people will start to leave at the end, to really thank all of my co-organizers today. I would like to thank Gideon Werner, the Novak Chair for Poland. I'd like to thank Monica Palotai with the Hudson Institute. In many ways, this is her creation from a conversation we had a few months ago in Washington, D.C. I'd like to thank Christoph Vedish, who's been instrumental. He helped coordinate. The two of them were just in Ukraine, as we'll hear. He helped coordinate and talk with the uh, Member of Parliament and our speaker this session coming in from the Ukraine. I'd also like to thank Dana Buchan with Mirtha Kulina. She also serves as the Romanian Honorary Consul to Connecticut and has been instrumental There are so many reasons we should applaud Dana that you don't even know. She's been instrumental in helping immigrants uh, arrive, locate, and be welcomed in Connecticut um, from the Afghan refugees to, as well, the effort with the Ukrainians coming in here. I would again like to thank all our student and all of our other volunteers, the Quinnipiac Democrats, the Quinnipiac Republicans, and the Quinnipiac Veterans Organization, uh, the other night at a, another school down the road, uh, Senator Blumenthal mentioned that this has really been a bipartisan issue, and it certainly was on our campus. So um, I, I really am glad to see that. I'd like to especially thank uh, Fabiola Alaska, Paul Capuzzo, Charles Urbano. Those are the three who've taken leadership in those groups. Additionally, Anya Grodalski. Genesis Siskoa, 
Daniel Cassiera, Nick Fizzano, and Tyler Bio for all the work and your support today. These are the young people who have organizer tags, who've been waiting out in the snow. I'd also like to thank who I think left, Beth Werner and Miklos Lescu, who have been here helping. With that, I will try to get it back to our panel presentation, and I'll turn it over to Monica. Thank you so much, Chris. In our next panel, we are going to discuss the challenges in Ukraine and in Europe. Please allow me to introduce the panelist. Right next to me is Krzysztof Veresh, and he's going to talk about the IDP situation in Ukraine. Right next to him, it's Professor Chaputovic, I'm sorry, and he's going to talk about the challenges for regional stability. Um, with Krzysztof, we just recently returned from Ukraine, and we've been visiting villages and uh, cities like Odessa, Kiev. We even went to Kherson Oblast, nine kilometers from the Russian position. Not one single house, not a school, nothing is intact. There's, there's nothing. No electricity, no water. When, when I describe or when I'm telling you nothing, that literally means nothing. This was our second visit in Ukraine since the unjustified invasion of Ukraine. But uh, the most striking and amazing and inspiring discovery, uh, how Ukrainian society creatively and amazingly is able to respond uh, with an incredible resilience. They just built uh, an amazing heaven in the chaos of this war. And one of the remarkable examples is the Opera House in Odessa. We watched a program, we watched the Barber of Seville in Odessa. And uh, locals are able to go there and live normal life for at least for, a, for two hours, as long as the show lasts, even though it starts with an announcement that if the air raid is on, we only need to proceed to the shelter, and if the air raid is over in an hour, then we can come up and the show goes on if nothing happened. But if it's not, then we can use our tickets next time. Christoph? Thank you. So, uh, the story of the Odessa Opera House is only one example of the immense societal uh, resilience that held steady. This, is this supposed to be this? Okay. <laughs> so the immense societal resilience that held steady during the past year of atrocities. In the t next 10 something minutes, I will talk about the general situation behind the front lines with special focus on the situation of those who were internally displaced in the country as a result of the Russian invasion. This is the Odessa Opera House that we visited with uh, Monica. Uh, a few days ago, the whole world could see President Biden walk the streets of Kyiv with President Zelensky with the air raid sirens blaring. He is not the only one, though, who is ignoring these warnings. While we were in Ukraine, people in the western city in Lviv, in Kyiv, the capital, and in the port city of Odessa mostly ignored the air raid warnings and went out their daily business. Since it's 2023, there is, of course, an application for air raids in Ukraine that you can download from the App Store, as you can see on the slide. And there are also Telegram and Twitter channels where you can follow in almost real life uh, the Russian aerial bombardments, real time, sorry. Uh, at the Twitter channels, uh, you see messages like 15 drones spotted headed towards Odessa, Ukrainian defenses working right now around Dnipro, or two explosions reported near Dnipro right now. The, there is a fun fact about the English version of the air raid siren. When the raid is over, then you have the voice of Mark Hamill saying, the air raid is over, may the force be with you. 
More than a month of uh, more than four months of bombardment left Ukrainian critical energy infrastructures severely damaged, with the repair costs estimated in the hundreds of billions of dollars. To avoid a total collapse of the energy system, right now there are rolling blackouts all over Ukraine, with many urban centers only having electricity for a few hours per day. Here we can see downtown, the main street and the main square of Lviv, which is a big city in western Ukraine, at 7 p.m. It's complete darkness. You have pedestrians uh, going around their business with flashlights. It has to be noted, though, that even during the rolling blackouts, public services operate. Trains and trams, for example, run 24-7 as they're supposed to be. There was only one day since the start of the Russian bombardment campaign uh, when the grid collapsed completely and the trains were stranded in the middle of fields. Because of the energy disruptions, there are generators humming in front of small businesses everywhere in Ukraine with coffee shops and restaurants serving at hotspots. People can just walk in and charge their phones and laptops, microwave their homemade food without having to actually buy anything. This is another example of exemplary societal solidarity. There are also government set up heated hotspots, tents running on generators with internet access. One of the aims of the Russian bombardment was to break the fighting spirit of the Ukrainians and trigger a second massive wave of refu refugees to put further pressure on the EU. With the end of winter approaching, we can safely say that this effort has failed. Firstly, the number of refugees in the EU who registered for the temporary protection scheme uh, of the European Union is, uh, was uh, 4.7 million at the end of November. Now at the end of February, it's 4.8 million, which is a meager 1.8% increase over a course of three months. If you look at uh, internally displaced people, their number has actually been steadily and slowly decreasing for a few months now, with the numbers uh, of returnees slowly climbing. In this graph, with blue, you can see the number of IDPs, which after reaching um, a high point of 8 million in May, uh, decreased, and now it's uh, kind of steadily holding uh, around uh, 5 million people. Uh, the green columns represent the number of uh, returnees, refugees, and IDPs who returned to their homes after being displaced for, displaced for more than two weeks. According to the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, the distribution is heavily skewed towards a longer duration of displacement. Currently, 83% of IDPs has been displaced, displaced for more than three months. Of course, it's difficult to return to your homes when they look like this. I took these pictures in Borodyanka, which is a small town next to Kyiv. Uh, the damage is from March and April 2022. According to the IOM, over half of the IDPs who do not intend to return uh, stated that the main reason for their reluctance was active fighting, the threat of artillery, and other security concerns. One third of them stated the lack of utilities and basic government services. A similar portion stated that their area of origin is under the military occupation of the Russian troops. And 19% stated that they can't return because of the damage or the complete destruction of their homes. Here I have to dispel a misconception. When it comes to the damage and destruction, people are not talking about the rockets and the drone strikes of uh, the energy infrastructure. It chiefly means uh, fighting, zones of active fightings, and also freshly liberated territories. Here is a map uh, from the 
from the Center International Institute for the Study of War. With red, you can see the occupied territories, and with blue, the recently liberated ones. We visited the, the town or small village of Oleksandrovska, which, because of uh, the heavy fighting, has been almost completely destroyed. I'm going to show you a video. Oh, it's okay without volume. So this is what you can see when you are uh, driving into Oleksandrivska. All those cars were cars of uh, people who were trying to flee. And this one uh, was a truck transporting humanitarian supplies that got hit by Russian artillery. Oleksandrivska is still in the range of Russian artillery. So the village is completely destroyed. Almost everyone fled, except, except for 30, 40 pensioners uh, who refused to leave because they have nowhere to go and they have uh, no one outside of the village. When the Ukrainian forces recaptured the village, the only thing they could do uh, was to evacuate. There is nothing really to repair here. I mean, if you don't have any kind of infrastructure standing, then you talk about rebuilding. You would have to rebuild the settlement from scratch. There is nothing to repair. For these old people who decided to stay, their only contact with the external world is those volunteers who are bringing them supplies twice every week. These are university students uh, who went to same courses at the University of Otessa and then banded together, uh, selected almost randomly um, a village uh, not far from Odessa, and then they partnered a big humanitarian distribution center and they started transporting aid to these pensioners. So that's also something that you can do in your free time as a university student in Ukraine. Another misconception about uh, IDPs, uh, which is kind of uh, the result of how the, the US media was covering, if it was covering at all, the situation of IDPs. It was always Lviv, Lviv, Lviv in Western Ukraine. Uh, this map shows the geographical distribution of IDPs inside Ukraine. As you can see, uh, most of the people, almost two million, are in the eastern macro region of the country. In the west, you only have 800,000 people. Uh, this misconception that everyone is in the west is because at the, at the beginning of the fighting, when there was chaos, everyone was fleeing from the west. But if we look at the number of IDPs staying in the Western Maku region, we can see that after the Russian troops pulled out from, uh, from around Kyiv, people started going home. Um, at the beginning of the fighting, after one month, you had almost three million people in the Western Maku region. Now you only have 800,000 people. Another misconception about IDPs. Um, people think that they live in camps, they live in shelters or train stations. That's not true. This is an IDP uh, camp um, in Lviv, uh, set up from uh, modular units paid for by the Polish government. Uh, you have three camps like this in Lviv hosting more than 1,000 people. However, this is not how most of the IDPs live in Ukraine. According to the IOM, only 3% of them live in camps like this. Most of them either live with family or friends or rented accommodations or uh, one of their other accommodations like another house or a weekend house. Um, these camps are really for the most vulnerable people, the elderly, the disabled, uh, people with chronic illnesses, and a lot of students. And finally, at the end of my presentation, I would like to talk about uh, what kind of humanitarian needs IDPs have. People assume that they need blankets and food kits. Uh, that's the thing that they most need, which is, again, not true. Uh, 
the most pressing need for IDPs right now is cash assistance. Unfortunately, only one third of them have employment right now. A lot of them are unemployed or living on cash assistance either from the government or from cash assistance programs run by uh, the UN or other big international NGOs. So the biggest question for 2023 is how we can solve the employment situation of these people, how the West can help them to get integrated back into the Ukrainian job market and how we can help them inside Ukraine so that they don't feel that they have to flee the country because they have no opportunities to work at home. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christoph, or as we used it for a few weeks or 10 days or so, and we happily used it and learned it, the word Jakuyu. Uh, and please allow me to introduce again or uh, Professor uh, Chaputovic. He is going to talk about uh, the regional, the regional stability. And after him, we are going to have a special guest straight from Lviv, and with his help, we are going to dig into the Russian minds. His think tank is focusing on researching and conducting surveys in Russia, what the Russia, Russian society thinks, what Russian people think about the war and about different questions. Professor? Thank you, thank you for this uh, uh, introduction and also for inviting me to take part in this uh, important conference, very important day, uh, the year of anniversary of standing up by Ukrainian people against this Russian aggression. I was dealing with uh, Ukraine as a foreign minister of Poland in 2018-2020, so at that time uh, my counterpart here in the United States was Rex Tillerson and then Mike Pompeo. And I had also a privilege to work in this time with three uh, foreign ministers of Ukraine, Pavlo Timkin, Vadim Pristaiko, and current minister uh, Dmitro Kuweba. And I would like to underline that for Poland, it has been always uh, importance of support of Ukrainian country to keep their sovereignty, uh, territorial integrity. I remember very well a discussion in the UN Security Council in May 2018. Poland chaired a council as a member of the Security Council of the time, and together with the United States, we organized debate on humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Uh, we raised important issues, how people are treated during that conflict, because that conflict already uh, was at, at place before the current stage of the war, which started a year ago. And I remember I proposed two issues. First, to establish peacekeeping operation uh, in Ukraine to control the situation to help Ukrainians at that time and somehow um, maybe to reconcile uh, Russia on the one hand and Ukraine uh, on the other. And the second proposal was to um, appoint by the Secretary General of United Nations a special envoy to Ukraine. There are such uh, envoys to other conflicts, Syria, um, uh, Morocco, other regions, but these proposals were not accepted. You can say that it was because Russia had to agree on that, but it was no, not only that. France, as a member of Security Council, a permanent member, also didn't want to create an instrument which could, uh, could have um, enabled to control the situation 
and influence the situation at that time. Uh, there was and still is a so-called Normandy format created by France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine, but it was not successful as we see today. So I think that international community made um, uh, mistakes which enabled uh, Russia to attack with the hope that they would win that war to attack Ukraine. But in 2020, we established with three foreign ministers, Dmitry Kuweba, Linas Linkevichus from Lithuania and myself from Poland, the so-called Lublin Triangle. So it's a format of cooperation between these two countries. It is uh, it has been appreciated by the Ukrainians because um, they are treated equally. The problem with Ukraine was that our countries of the region, I will talk about this uh, Bucharest nine countries, but Lithuania, Poland and others, Central European countries like Hungary, like Romania, we are members both of European Union and NATO, but Ukraine is not a, not a member of these organizations. Therefore, for them to be in a format, to have a cooperation when they are treated equally as a sovereign country with countries like Poland, Lithuania was very, very important. It's a recognition as a normal state. So in our diplomacy, uh, contacts within the European Union are crucial, NATO, for their diplomacy, they have on the United Nations and, and maybe uh, CSC as an organization. So now th this format develops. There are meetings between foreign ministers, other ministers, but also presidents of these three countries regularly in Warsaw, in Kiev, and in Vilnius, which helps uh, Ukraine to maintain its international position as an independent, important state. So my point is that Ukraine sh should be treated as a normal state. Of course, we know that there is a war, but it's very good that there are visits of leaders of President Biden, <laughs> President Biden, very symbolic, very important visit, giving signals to Ukrainians that they will be defended by the world. They will be supported but also like uh, senators from the United States and uh, other politicians. Yesterday, there was a visit in Kiev of Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki, just exactly in the day of anniversary, and he declared, and Poland already provided first Leopard tanks to Ukraine, because our idea is to mobilize international community simply to continue supporting militarily with weapon uh, Ukraine, that they can continue their resistance and fight, maybe fight back in, in the future. So Poland provided more than 2,050 tanks, but for the first time yesterday, this German-made tanks, Leopard tanks, which is a kind of a new chapter. I fully agree that planes would be next step. It is necessary if we uh, hope that Ukraine has a chance to win that, that war. Let me just maybe say also how we see the stake of that war. So it is a challenge for regional stability. It's a title of the presentation of, 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 the, of that panel of my presentation. But I would like to say that it's not only the challenge to regional stability, but it is the challenge to the stability of the whole international system. Uh, I agree with the opinions that it is a threat that Russia may continue her imperialistic policy by attacking other countries. We learned a lesson from history, history that imperialists never stop until they are defeated. And let me remind you the words of President Lech Kaczynski 
in Tbilisi in 2008. He said at that time, now Georgia, tomorrow Ukraine, after tomorrow maybe the Baltic states, and then maybe it will be time for my country. So there is a question, one, why we didn't listen to that? Why we did not, re we as an international society, we did not react properly after Russia attacked Georgia. And then Russia continued by attacking Ukraine in 2014. And then we see an escalation. Again, imperialists never stop. We have to remember about that. So the stake of that war is the freedom of democracies in the world and the rules-based international order. Of course, we cannot also accept an interpretation of that war that it is kind of a war by proxies. It's a clear uh, attacker and this is the country which is a victim. So Ukraine is a victim, Russia is an aggressor, already condemned by the international, um, international community, by the United States. So Ukraine has full rights to existence within its internationally recognized border. So some countries think that we, China recently that, that maybe we, our approach should be more balanced. We should treat these two, so to say, sides to the conflict equally. But it's not a true, it's clear difference. Victim and aggressor. There was also a discussion here um, about refugees as the main subject of the conference. Indeed, Poland received um, a lot of refugees most of this 8 million passed through our territory. Currently, we have uh, 1 million, uh, 1.5 million refugees from Ukraine uh, from that war. There is uh, also a substantial number of Ukrainians who came earlier, but I do not count them to that uh, numbers. So the, there is a difference because it was a surprise inter internationally the question was why they are not in refugee camps, as everywhere. No, they are treated by Polish society, by Polish families. They are invited to their flats, and then if they work, they can rent an apartment. They have the same rights as Poles. They can send uh, children to schools. We are looking for also for Ukrainian um, teachers for them. We want them to maintain their culture. They are here, they are in Poland with the hope that they would come back. And indeed many, after a few months, many Ukrainians came back and they started to work in Ukraine. It was in spring, the situation was, was better. But the inflow of refugees continues. And of course we have to, we have to help them but the sooner the war ends, the better for them just to come back. And I fully agree, 90% of these refugees are women with children, men fight, and men are not allowed to leave the country because they, their duty is to defend their nation. Poland is the front line of NATO, and we have common border with both with Ukraine and with Russia, Therefore, our position is somehow similar to the one of Germany during the Cold War. It's a front line of one block. That situation is, is similar, as I said. So there is a discussion that the role of Central European countries, and Poland particularly is the biggest one of them, is growing. And indeed, Poland is a key logistic hub for military and economic assistance to Ukraine and for humanitarian assistance. Um, and we proved that our uh, reading of the policy of Russia was right. We weren't 
West European countries not to develop relations, trade relations with Russia, not to build Nord Stream 1, not to build Nord Stream 2, not to become dependent in energy sectors, and not to provide financial means for Russia to modernize uh, the Russian army. Uh, so now it is an understanding, and more, more or less uh, the world is united. Uh, they start to understand uh, the threat Russia creates. But let me also underline that for, for Poles, for us, uh, to defend Ukraine is in accordance with the values we share, but also it is in accordance with our interests, because they defend their independence, and they defend also Poland's independence or, or uh, European one. So that it's convergence, values of, and interests, which is easy for uh, Poles to simply to be engaged in that conflict. Um, and finally, my final remarks about very important visit of President Joe Biden to Kiev and to Warsaw, particularly uh, to the meeting with the so-called Bucharest 9 format. This is a format of countries, members of both European Union and NATO, nine countries, who were communists uh, in communist bloc previously. Um, so there are three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Then four Visegrad countries, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, and two countries uh, with the access to Baltic Sea, Romania and Bulgaria. They are, they are nine countries. The format was created to orchestrate, coordinate policy within NATO. And at that time, the, the meeting um, was uh, the, the President Biden participated in that meeting together with, with uh, NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg. So, declaration was signed by all participants of these leaders of these nine countries, plus American President and nine NATO Secretary, that that we will continue supporting Ukraine. We have to enhance NATO presence on the eastern flank of the alliance, and the countries agreed to support each other in the event of, of threat. I think it is a symbolic, symbolic, so to say, um, signal also to Russia that these countries uh, cooperate, and also it is an evidence the growing importance of that region also for American, uh, in American policy, uh, what I mentioned. Uh, uh, we are on the front line. And for us, American leadership is crucial. Let me also say that at the beginning, Pres President Biden's administration made some mistakes, maybe, at the beginning of term, because by lifting sanction on Nord Stream 2, for example, or by investing in Germany uh, as a country which would represent American interest in Europe. Now, it seems that our interests converge of these countries of Central Europe, altogether it's more than uh, 100 uh, million inhabitants. They are small countries, but altogether it's a uh, weight more than uh, Germany or France. So there is a convergence of interest and also evidence that we share the same values. And for us also, the visit of President Biden to Kiev was very symbolic. It demonstrates that now it, the Ukraine is a priority in American policy. And also it demonstrates that somehow President Biden invested his political standing, his political career in the success of Ukraine. So we fully agree with that. So it are my, it, these are my remarks. I will stop here and open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaputovich, for your valuable insights and important analysis.
We're trying to get Lviv, and please welcome Sviatoslav Nivzdovsky and listen to him about the Russian mines. And till we get Sviatoslav, uh, we met him a couple of weeks ago in Lviv in a coffee that was, uh, when we approached the coffee, it seemed like it was closed. It was not, it was just an air raid, and during air raid, you're not supposed to go into a coffee. Can so you hear that's us? That's how we met him. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. So pleased to see you, and uh, love to thank you on behalf of all Ukrainians, if I might, for all of your support for your attention to Ukraine, for your ongoing endeavors to actually bring us more weapons, more support. I was quite pleased to hear the words of Senator Blumenthal today, and um, that will be our victory together, I hope, quite soon. And um, I'll start with sharing my screen, so please let me know if you can see some slides. Yes. Great. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about uh, is basically to dig a little bit um, into the mysterious Russian soul and Russian minds and um, psychological state of Russian society um, in different dimensions. And I'll just uh, briefly uh, tell you what's the mission of my organization. I founded um, at the beginning of this war. So we are called Open Minds Institute. And open minds in particular here in the name is not a coincidence. So our mission and goal is to actually somehow try to um, not just persuade people in Russia that something is wrong, but rather create this open-mindedness and uh, you know ability to comprehend finally that they are the victims of, of uh, propaganda, of authoritarianism, and that they can actually do something about that. Because if if not, we they will they have no chance to to go through that transformation themselves probably. So we aim to to make some data driven behavioral change for peace and freedom in the region. And uh, there are some preconditions why I think it's important. So first, most likely, if nothing is done with it within Russia, Russia can finance the war almost forever. Like they still have a lot of funding from L. Uh, oil and gas trade and uh, spend just a fraction of that on the war. And as you know, in the long term wars, uh, public opinions are important, right? And, and even we know that Putin and pre presidential administration of Putin, they do their own uh, opinion polls. They have some health metrics, let's call it, of, of a society they track, and they are quite interested in measuring that. And that's a sign that they actually are quite vulnerable and susceptible to the public opinion overall. So what we do, we of course research Russian society, but also on top of that, we create policies and campaigns and narratives that can be disseminated within Russia, because we believe that simply trying to protect Ukraine or EU or the United States from the influence of Russian propaganda is not enough, but we should go one step beyond that and try to also influence Russians themselves who are the victims of that propaganda. And the proposed solution was actually, and it's not just about my organization, but uh, about the huge decentralized community that works in Ukraine, but also has huge support in the United States, is to combine different disciplines that maybe were not that well in communication before this war, uh, and that can create on the intersection on different, uh, of different fields of sciences and uh, domains of knowledge, a unique synergetic effect. So we, we are talking now in particular about behavioral sciences, about, of course, political psychology, but also about cultural anthropology, which means taking into account some local um, cultural, you know, peculiarities. Uh, we're talking about media and digital distribution, and of course, some um, um, big data and data science. And there are some objectives we have um, here. Of course, we want to decrease the trust in Russian government overall. We want to break some mobilization efforts. Uh, let's say they have some waves of conscription, as you know, and always they try to conscript more and more people. So if we just can slow down that, that's also a huge success. And 
finally the break of the spiral of silence that's happening in Russia. Basically, if there are even people who do not really support the war, they feel that they are quite alone and, you know, they don't have anyone around that would support their opinion as well. So that's something we, we want to actually tackle it here. And now um, I'll just tell briefly uh, what's our overall strategy and framework without going too much into the detail. Uh, so first, of course, we analyze deeply what's the Russian strategy, what kind of uh, narratives are pushed by the propaganda, how their troll farms work, for example, uh, what's the usual uh, discussion topics uh, in social media among different social clusters. Then we try to research and also segment population. And I will show you a few findings we, we have currently. There are different parameters. We do that, uh, sociodemographic profiles, emotions, war attitudes, trust in government, media consumption patterns, uh, all of these kind of things. Once we do that, so once we understand the strategy and once we have this clusterization, we move on to actually identifying the narratives and counter narratives and policies basically that can be implemented and disseminated in Russia. And we have our own experimental uh, methodology for that where we try to see whether there is any kind of causal effect possible on the opinion shift, but sometimes also behavioral change. And once we find that, we go and target these particular clusters with personalized messages. But that's not only just, you know, news articles or some conventional things. We have to be very creative. We have to create sometimes songs and jokes and, uh, you know, uh, phone call scripts emails, uh, some alternative um, social media ads, all kinds of things to be able to penetrate. And finally, we measure the effectiveness of all of that with some big data and machine learning. So, and that's the whole cycle that we go through and through every week or two, basically trying to iteratively improve the whole machinery of uh, counter propaganda fight. Um, so what's the Russian strategy? And I will just now go quickly through some of the steps to show you in greater detail how it actually looks like. So uh, first, it's very like straightforward. Uh, the consumer of Russian propaganda is bombarded with a lot of different explanation of what's going on. So just look at that. Uh, when they started the war, they were explaining that um, there is NATO forces uh, in Ukraine, there are some bio labs, uh, there are Nazis, uh, God forbid there are, you know, uh, other kind of uh, very, very uh, strange and illogical things. And there were like 10, 20 explanations, which eventually results in people starting thinking, oh my God, it's too hard to know what's true and what's going on there for sure. So I will not even try anymore. You know, that's something for politicians. I just blindly follow them. And this is a very dangerous thing because it results in the complete death of agency and complete frustration and very passive, politically non-engaged citizens. Uh, and that's what they achieved quite successfully. And this whole propagandistic machine was working starting from the early 2000s, but had it roots also, of course, in the Soviet Union with the experience of propaganda during the Cold War period. Um, so we have our own response strategy. And uh, I know it may be, um, you can't really see properly all of the um, texts on this scheme. So it, it, it doesn't really matter. Like we will not go into the much detail. Just I'm just showing you one of the examples how we can craft a particular tactical goal and tie it to a particular um, segment of Russian population, which would lead eventually us to two main goals. First, we want uh, to somehow make it impossible to continue the hostilities, the actual active stage of warfare. And for that, we need to demoralize soldiers, to break mobilization efforts, prevent psychological mobilization of society, and maybe even help someone engage in acts of Italian strike or sabotage. Uh, that's on the one hand, and that, that's what a short term, long term is, uh, of course, 
making some social pressure on Russian elites, because of course in Russia, you know, people do not really decide much, but there are elites still a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand people who are around Kremlin and who make some decisions. And of course we can reflexively, let's call it, influence them uh, through creating some pressure from the bottom, from the grassroots, and we have our own strategy for that. So, and in combination, these two might actually lead us to some uh, long-term changes. That's not happening overnight. That's happening over a long period of time. Sometimes it's hard to measure, but that's our best bet. And that's how we do the informational warfare, basically. Uh, so in order to do this kind of informed decision, we, of course, need to have some very good research process. So uh, I'll just quickly go through, because we're in a more like academic environment, of course, uh, and want to show you some of the findings of our research, but also other uh, combination and summary and meta studies of other research being done in Russia uh, over the last year. First, uh, we found a way to actually segment Russian population according to more than 20 parameters. So it boils down eventually, at least in our research, to five main groups. We have uh, loyalists who are loyal to Putin, but not necessarily pro-war. So it doesn't really matter for them that there is war or there is no war, but they're just loyal to Putin. Hawks. Hawks are actually the guys who are really pro-war. So they want to destroy Ukraine. They want to destroy West. They sometimes even criticize Putin or Ministry of Defense for not being effective enough. And they have their own leaders like Prigozhin or Girkin, some of the guys you might know, very scary ones, right wing mostly. And there are lots of hawks in Russia. And then we have uncertain people who are hesitant, uh, you know, um, and well, they are sometimes poor, sometimes ju just, you know, silent, let's say. Uh, then we have poor liberals. Those are the guys that are mostly anti-war, but they are very frustrated, psychologically demobilized. They don't feel the, any power, and they also economically tend to rather be poorer compared to all the other groups. And we also have moderate liberals. We rely a lot on their support. Uh, maybe they might become some agents of social change because they have slightly better resources, slightly better psychological conditions, but that's a very thin, as you can see, limited percentage of population, unfortunately. So we tend to work with all of the groups and there are different tactical and strategic goals for all of them. For example, for Hawks, we want them uh, to, and we want to exacerbate some conflicts between them and Putinists. Uh, for loyalists, we want to actually make them, even the, if they're pro-Putin, but just at, at least um, make them anti-war. Um, and for uncertain, we want to shift them more to the liberal side, right? So it's just long story short. Some of the research findings, um, um, if you can't see the numbers, it doesn't really matter. I'll just briefly go through some of the um, slides here. First, we, measure, we are measuring currently the sentiments about the direction of the country. So what, what you can see here is the number of um, keywords uh, that re are related to the question in what direction Russia is moving overall, uh, let's say, um, and negative, um, we picked negative keywords here, which means like people discussing topics like um, Russia is moving in wrong direction. Russia is not uh, making something wise. Uh, this war is kind of... Uh, like uh, needless for Russia, let's say. And what, what we are seeing um, over the last year is the increase actually in the number of this negative, um, negative um, volume of keywords uh, related to the direction of the country, which is a good plan for us, I think. And you can see some spikes, ups and downs all, all over. So um, of course it's just limited sample size, but we are trying to do our best to enlarge these um data and measure that better so that's the first learning quite important one the next one is the readiness to fight so you might have a question okay so there are people actually men in russia who would be ready to take the weapons and go and shoot ukrainians or whatever they believe there are nato soldiers and 
initially we thought, well, there are probably not that many people like that. You have to be really dumb to do that, right? But as it turns out, the number is quite huge. I, it doesn't like it. It's very like we are very limited in the capacity to say the exact numbers. But what's important here is the rise in trend. So the readiness to fight is increasing in Russia, at least as you can see from May 2022 to October 2022, it increased almost in um, by what by like 40% from 24 to 33%, which is huge. And which means propaganda is doing a good job at justifying the war and probably creating this kind of existential uh, war uh, sentiment that people uh, buy into and believe that if they do not protect their country, uh, they can be evaporated. Next thing is the trust in government. And uh, look here, I we do uh, opinion polls and more like classic sociological research, of course, but this kind of thing is um has even more limitations uh and that's why I, I i'm showing you mostly big data findings because they are better predictor of what's really going on you know numbers don't lie i mean people who anonymously in the internet can share their voice and express their opinions are slightly better indicated than just asking person in a survey what do they think because they would of course there are some social desirable answers and you know fear of being wherever convicted later so that's why i'm showing you mostly big data findings so as for trust in government we have negative and positive um variations of keyboards uh, and both actually are declining uh, of course there is um uh, there was a huge spike as you can see 42k uh, keywords here we could measure in negative uh, and that's, of course, a sample size, like the, the real number is bigger, uh, the negative keyboards, uh, and that's happened exactly when the mobilization, uh, mobilization was um, announced in, in Russia by Putin, uh, and now it levels off, uh, but uh, the declining trend might indicate here that there is just, you know, uh, less interest towards what, what's government doing overall, and that's also a bad sign, which means society doesn't serve its function as a watchdog of the government. That's what we usually see in Western democracies, in Ukraine, of course, and other countries, but that's not what you can see in Russia. Uh, some other things. Russians wondering when the war will end. So what we did, we went to the biggest uh, search engine in Russia, Yandex, and looked for all of the keywords related to the questions like when the war will end, um, how much we'll fight, how, like, for how many months that will last, any kind of naive questions or more logical questions. And as you can see, this interest was quite high at the beginning. Then people got used to the war probably. And then it spiked once again, of course, when the mobilization of the soldiers, the, the second wave was announced and, and it keeps kind of high which means there is interest and probably people are actually wondering in Russia. And for some reason, maybe they're not really happy with what's going on. That, that may be a possible explanation. Uh, next thing. Uh, so in order to measure the dissatisfaction with government, uh, you can't really ask people directly, of course, but we found, uh, I would say, smart way. One of my analysts just suggested, what if we take all of the spare words in Russian language, and there are like 50, 70 words and all of the different variations, and see when people use swearings close to the names of Russian political elites, Putin, words like government, parliament, etc. And I think it's kind of elegant way to measure the hatred and anger towards the government. And what we could see and what you can see here is once the mobilization was announced, once again, we see a clear trend that people are quite angry about that. And we were trying to do something with that as well. One more thing, and I think in particular, uh, might be of an interest uh, for this uh, con conference is the migration in Russia. So uh, we did some research uh, 
Uh, this date, by the way, uh, seven days after mobilization was announced, there were approximately 200,000 people leaving Russia and then 500,000 more with the next month. Uh, this is a report by Reuters in their approximation. So who are the people actually trying to migrate from Russia? Mostly, uh, average age of migrant is, of course, uh, quite younger than the average of the population, 32 versus 46. That's quite logical. But what's even more interesting is the level of education and the economic um, wellness, let's call it, uh, level of uh, income, uh, which is extremely high compared to average Russian among migrants here. So we have uh, 80% of people, among migrants, 80% of people had higher education, while only 26% among all of the Russian population has, and, and uh, 15% um, could afford anything, which means like very wealthy people. Uh, I'm not sure, like that's how we stated the question, uh, but probably it's like the income of uh, two, $300,000 per year or more. Uh, and uh, yeah, that that actually creates uh, a like a particular opportunity for us to separately um, separately discuss uh, separately actually target migrants and and uh, try to persuade and, and influence them. And uh, being mindful uh, of time, just uh, probably last slide wanted to have a kind of brief overview of all of the uh success measurement metrics we use for all of these studies so and uh for other interventions so we have performance and engagement metrics where we measure the effectiveness of a particular channel of communication we have attitudinal change metrics we also measure the virality of particular narrative and message like how viral it went in the social media and finally, we try to measure behavioral change. So what was real impact on things like employment, for example, um, maybe a level of potential progress or progress happening or something, something similar. And my final message, basically, why we are doing that, we believe that every Russian we can persuade not to fight or if we can anyhow slow down the war machine, it will result in fewer deaths of Ukrainian citizens and, of course, fewer deaths of, of Russians, right? So. So why, that's why I think this kind of work is important. And uh, here is uh, some information about us. Feel free to contact me if you have any particular question or suggestion or project proposal or research proposal. And I hope uh, we can do something great together and help uh, to end this war sooner. Thanks. Thank you very much. Please, please stay online. Um, let's open it first to questions and answers uh, for the entire panel. So I have a question for our last presenter. Um, there's a very famous image of a protester in Moscow holding a blank piece of paper. And that person was immediately arrested and detained. So if the average Russian citizen, or perhaps activist, can't even show the smallest gesture of protest, how can the general population be persuaded to take any action? That was for Sviatoslav. Hello. Uh, yes, I think that's a very bright question, and that's something we are actually pondering um, on and and then thinking about. So, look, I think it's a very beautiful and very smart tactic of Russian um, uh, police and, and propaganda. So, what they actually show sometimes on TV the progress, but when they show the progress, they show actually one or two person protesting. They never show a bigger. Um, um, you know, um, like group of people um, because they want to make it socially non-desirable behavior or some, or even present it as just someone being so, you know, crazy going on the streets with some kind of transference. 
So that's first, and that makes uh, the spiral of silence, of course, going down. What we can do about that? Our goal is not to make immediate protests in Russia. We try to do that and we failed a lot of times. And Navalny team tried to do that and failed. And all of the other opposition leaders, I think in Russia, unfortunately failed to do effective progress. So instead, currently the, the strategy for behavioral change is to actually mm, present people with individual tools how they can slow down the whole system and the whole war machine. So for example, presenting the person the instruction how they can work um, slower and maybe, I don't know, follow the instructions to the way that it becomes just, you know, illogical and it slows down the whole work process, but that will slow eventually the productivity of the factory that produces weapons. Or uh, give some hooligans uh, tools to actually, um, I don't know, uh, create some troubles for local uh, conscription office. Uh, in the long run, maybe in, in, a, in the timeline of a year or two, uh, we of course want them to progress, but I think we have to accumulate this uh, first like uh, critical mass of people who would be ready to go on the streets. And unfortunately it's not close yet to, to happen, I think. And that's, that's a huge disappointment. So rather than that, and rather than being uh, like putting, a, like batting on, on the progress, we bet on someone within Russian elites to feel enough empowerment to actually uh, start pushing the line for um, stopping the special military operation. That's, that's my answer. And a follow-up question. Does Pussy Riot play any role in the anti-war movement in Russia? Honestly, I, I'm not the best person to, to be asked that. I don't really follow them closely. So I uh, can't say for sure uh, due to just my uh, limitation of information about them. Is there a way we could legally send the Russian oligarchs' children who are attending school, who um, they are in America and, uh, and it's wonderful. I'm, I was so happy to have Russian Americans in America. I still am, but their children who are from the oligarch families, could they be made non-person grata? Could they be sent back so that the oligarchs would realize that their children are going to die too. It's 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 uh, something I wanted to think that put into the mind. Send these people back so they have to realize that they just can't live high in the hog here in America um, while the Ukrainians are dying unnecessarily. So you're basically uh, talking about uh, sanctioning individuals who are not uh, connected directly uh, to the war effort, but they are related to people who run the Russian war machine. So far in the European Union and uh, in the US, only uh, those people have been sanctioned um, who are somehow connected to the Russian war effort, but recently, there has been talks in um, Europe proposed by uh, a few uh, more hawkish uh, member states to find a way to be able to, yes, sanction, uh, I don't know, the, the daughter of uh, Putin, for example. I think she's now in Switzerland, right? She is, yes. But when it comes to international law, but Monica is better suited to answer the international law part, that can be very, very tricky. And at the same time, there is no political consensus for it. Is anything like that being done in Poland? Poland is one of these hawkish states, I think. But the Russians avoid coming, uh, going to the west through Poland. Uh, Poland shared the um, OEC 
uh, organization last year, uh, you, and there is once a year meeting of foreign ministers of six of them from these all EU member states, but also Russia, Ukraine, and other, um, Kazakhstan, and other countries. And we simply did not allow the Russian delegation to participate in that meeting. It was some EU member states wanted them to maintain this contact, to, 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 the, to come. Usually, um, Minister Wavrov is present at this, uh, uh, the meeting of the ministerial, we call it, ministerial of the organization. So I mentioned also during my presentation that for EU member states, NATO member states, other countries are not so important because we have many diplomatic contacts within, within these Western organizations. But for countries like Russia, but also Ukraine and others, Belarus, uh, Central Asian countries, the, this organization is very important because they don't have alternatives. Therefore, it is, I think, important to um, uh, simply uh, treat uh, seriously a Ukrainian attempt and application to the Euro European Union and NATO to make them member of these organizations, and Pol Poland is in favor of that. But um, I already said about this uh, OIC, uh, uh, we did not allow them and they did not come. We allowed only um, to come to Poland, the ambassador uh, of Russia to Vienna, to this organization. But uh, this week there is a meeting in Vienna, parliamentary assembly of that uh, organization. And the Russian delegation is invi was invited by the, by the Hungarians and by others. So argument is, so, so these, these are active members of Duma, of Russian parliament, which are very out outspoken against Ukraine. Ukra Ukraine boycotted, Lithuania boycotted, other, other delegations took part in this meeting. So just to show you that it's not simple and the, uh, even the Western world, world is not united in this, uh, behind this, so to say, policy of uh, just excluding Russia from international community because it should be our goal until the aggression lasts. Okay. It's discussed, yeah, still. Just one more thought, like how you can uh kind of make them leave is by stop issuing visas for them because after a while if you stop issuing visas like for example Poland and uh, one of the Baltic countries I think it's Latvia uh, stopped issuing any kind of visas to to Russians then they can't come in the country and those people who are in the country with the visa after a while their visa is going to expire We'll move on in the interest of time, but thank you. I don't know the American answer, but just so you know, um, Senator Blumenthal the other night mentioned that all of the assets being seized from the oligarchs, are they're trying to sell them and use that money in the rebuilding efforts of Ukraine. So, other questions, please. Um, Yes, I had a question for the gentleman that spoke previous on the um, Zoom's presentation. Okay. Uh, my question was, sir, is I've noticed looking back on the history of how Russia has fought its war, they make the exact same mistakes over and over again. If you look back at when the Russians invaded Georgia back in 08, the same complaints about traffic jams and soldiers not having the proper munitions, you see that pop up. You also see it pop up in the first Chechen war where Russian soldiers went into Chechnya still with their USSR standard issue equipment. So I wanted to ask, how much is your information directly targeted towards Russian soldiers to help them understand that the same leadership that's probably been there since the 1980s and 1990s is still effectively leading them to the same mistakes that those same leaders had to deal with back when they were junior lieutenants or junior conscripts back in the 80s and 90s. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, so 
we have some limited capacity to actually target Russian soldiers. Um, it's very hard because once they are mobilized and when they move to the Ukrainian territories, quite often um, they are asked to just uh, handle their cell phones and they cannot really have proper access to the internet and there are numbers of limitations. But still there are some operations together with the Ukrainian um, special um, forces and cyber units of armed forces of Ukraine that I unfortunately cannot fully talk about uh, in full capacity of detail, but uh, we are making sure we can actually reach out to the soldiers as well. And in particular, we are trying to actually talk to their families, wives and, and uh, mothers. And we found it to be a quite, um, quite um, impactful channel of communication as uh, they, they might be a better influence for, for the soldier than just us doing that directly. So that's, that's my um, quick answer. Thank you, sir. If, if I may add, uh, if you're listening to the news in the past two decades since Vladimir Putin got into power, you can see that the rehabilitation of Stalin is quite in intense or it's intensifying. Now, whitewashing history and brainwashing people, it definitely, you know, as we can see it on the data as well, it, it really does work. I mean, just like a few weeks ago in... Uh, in Volgograd, that used to be Stalingrad. There was the 80th anniversary of uh, the uh, Battle of Stalingrad. It was a huge celebration, and, and it was the second or third uh, Stalin bus that was unveiled. Now, if you're familiar with the history, you know, you know what Stalin stands for. So you know what you can expect from Putin, and you know what you can expect from Stalin as well. So that also explains why it hasn't changed, because history has been changed. History has been whitewashed and people's, people have been brainwashed as well. So for, for the Russians, the uh, Second World War is a great patriotic war. So they needed to go back to something that is valuable for them. Minus, they, need, they needed to deduct all those horrible things, Holodomor, and I can mention a lot of other things. You know, Stalin killed more people uh, than Hitler. So they needed to deduct all these and, 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 and whitewash history. So that's how denazifying is coming into the picture as well. Because in the Great Patriotic War, they were the ones who, who expelled the Nazis from Soviet Union and, and helped Europe. So this is where they go back to. And this is how propaganda works, and that's why it is so important. And that's why they don't change, because they are constantly being prone to these propaganda issues. Actually, President Putin a few years ago said that uh, the fact that Nazi Germany invaded Poland was Poland's fault <laughs> in a speech. So I'm, you have the, the West should pay actually more attention. Uh, to all these things, because uh, the way how how you whitewash history, how you try to rewrite history, can be a very good indication in what you are going to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank of you. you as well. Let's, in the interest of time, let's collect the questions quickly, and then we'll do any final answers to any piece. Saul, you're going to take a step down. All right. Then we'll collect these two real quick and get back to back, and then we'll let them respond. Oh. You hear me now? Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk on the internet and the news about the Russians are planning a new, more advanced campaign and on the other side of the story, you hear that 97% of the Russian army is already in Ukraine and they don't have anything left, which I find a little hard to believe. Overall, what is your reaction and thoughts as to a new campaign from Russia taking into account, will they use Belarus as a staging area? Will the Belarus army participate? 
and also uh, what is going on in Moldavia. Will the Russians also attack in Moldavia? Thank you. Yes, my name is Myron Melnick, and I represent uh, the Ukrainian community and the Ukrainian-American veterans of America, along with my fellow veterans here. So we're U.S. veterans, not Ukrainian veterans, but we have been standing with Ukraine since the war began, and actually back to 2014, because those of you who have been following events know that the war really began then with the forcible seizure of Crimea and the start of the hostilities in the Donbas. We invite you to our table here. We continue our support. We've shipped uh, seven big shipments to Ukraine. We continue to raise funds and we welcome any support or positive publicity that you can provide. But I want to bring up another question, um, the question of sanctions. We hear on the media, and you've heard it also, that last year the Russian GDP declined by 2%, only 2% with all these sanctions. We're hearing now projections that this year the Russian economy is actually going to grow slightly in terms of GDP. Where does this information come from? It comes from organizations here in the United States, the World Bank and the IMF. These are organizations that are based in Washington. They're largely funded by U.S. taxpayer doll dollars, taxpayer dollars, and this information is false. And I want to bring up an example of something we learned just a few days ago. Professor Ball was at that event at Yale. There's a professor, Jeffrey Sonnenfeld, who has been following economic activity in Russia over the last year. And he's documenting from his own sources the true state of the Russian economy. He has a team of researchers, PhD students, statisticians who gather information from direct sources within Russia, not just from Russian economists, not just from people who purport to be experts on the Russian economy here in the United States. These statistics contradict exactly what the World Bank and the IMF is stating. And these statistics published by the IMF and the World Bank is not just information, disinformation here in the United States. This is information that goes around the world because these two organizations are international institutions. So here we have a flagrant example of how harmful this information can be. Professor Sonnenfeld has contacted and has worked with um, um, the directors of the IMF, Gordieva, um, actually, she's, yes, she's IMF, and Laplace, who is now gone, there is a new director of uh, uh, the World Bank, and their answer was, well, Russia is such a small percentage of the world economy that we really don't spend a lot of time digging into these statistics. He was outraged. He said, you're publishing a report for worldwide distribution and nobody vetted these numbers? If you were a journalist, you would be fired. So this is an ongoing campaign that the professor is going to be waging, but I wanted to bring this up today because there's a lot of distinguished uh, people here, and I know that uh, Mr. Yazdowski uh, in Ukraine would be interested in hearing this. So this is a campaign that's going to unfold now to really get the facts straight in these worldwide institutions. Thank you. Questions from our panelists? Thank you so much. I guess it was a very uh, valuable and interesting panel and especially we are rarely discussing what is going on in Russia, especially mainly and because we don't have information what is going on in Russia. So talking to somebody uh, 
who has surveys, who conducts surveys in Russia, it's really valuable. On the other hand, thanks to the gentleman uh, that brought up the topic of, uh, of, of we brought up the topic of, of Stalinization. We have to also pay attention to what Putin is saying because he's very candid. He's openly talking about his position and his plans, but propaganda is also very important. And uh, the other remark I would like to make that, uh, that we are not paying at en enough attention to the, uh, to the internally displaced people situation in Ukraine. We are talking a lot about refugees, but in order to uh, help Ukraine recover and rebuild it, uh, IDPs has to have much better support and attention in the future. Thank you so much. And I guess I wrap up this panel, unless you would like to add something. If I may just to the, yeah, just, just to this, to this issue, so to these questions concerning um, new pos possible offensive of Russia. There is a, that nobody knows how uh, the war will end. And Belarus, I think uh, it, it, it's good that it's not, Belarusians are not uh, involved militarily in this conflict. Hopefully they will uh, they will not in in the future. Of course, uh, Belarus is an ally of Russia, but but um, and very much dependent. Lukashenko is very much dependent on on Putin. Moldova, the Russians, I think they want a change of government there to 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 make it more, so to say, understanding Russian interests. And there is a threat that it will be a pressure because Moldova is very much dependent on Russia's oil and gas but there is an expectation in western countries that it will be ukrainian counteroffensive somewhere in spring particularly we see it from europe that in the united states president biden representative administration they expect it will be something because how we how we understand it in europe the united states and the administration needs kind of a Mm, uh, 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 evidence that the very generous uh, military support for Ukrainian, uh, Ukra Ukraine is efficient and uh, to gather further support. So maybe, maybe it will be also a counteroffensive from, uh, from Ukraine. Uh, definitely Western weapon is, uh, is, is much better. He mars others uh, rockets when they, you can hit targets farther. It's very successful for for them. So this is this is my comment. Thank you so much, Professor. And also, there is this: if you if you want to uh, describe European and uh, American attitudes towards uh, supporting Ukraine, then the most simplest way to describe is more Russian atrocities plus more Ukrainian bravery usually equals more support from the West. Thank you, Christophe. Thank you. A round for our panelists.